So the plan is, I'm not sure like whether this kind of ideas, ideas like, you know, people's history of America. So like mm -hmm. your lived memories. So we'll try to go back to your own memories. And I think, you know, the lived memory is more important to me, like what you witnessed, your experiences. Um, Julian, so welcome. Welcome to my podcast session. Thank you. Um, this is Conversations with Politics. Um, Julian, uh, the first question, obligatory question, where were you born and raised? I was born in Littlehampton, Sussex, which is a seaside town where my mother and father were living and his, my father's mother that was living in that town too. Mm. And he was at that time uh, studying to be a lawyer. He was an articled clerk, as they call it. Okay. Um, so that's a, that's a surprise for me because I was always thinking of Julian is American, born, brought up, and everything. <laughs> no, 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 not not at all. No. <laughs> no. So to, I mean, now I kind of you know since you you said that you were born in Sussex, so suddenly I I I noticed that your accent changed a bit. Like you you are more sounding like Englishman. <laughs> Well, my wife says that certain times, you know, when I'm doing certain things, my accent will change depending <laughs> upon who I'm talking to and what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, like, what can be your earliest memories growing up in Sussex? Did you have any memories of Sussex? No, not really, because I was shipped over to um, Malaysia uh, when I was about two and a half or so. So I spent some time there and then some time for a while in, in Australia, mm. because at that time there was a major insurgency in Malaysia called the, uh, called the emergency, mm. where there was just like Vietnam, you know, the, the, the local said, you know, <laughs> what are you people doing back here? You know, <laughs> so, um, so there, there was, you know, I haven't really got into the history of what was going on in those days, and I really should, because the British were really no better than the French and the Americans in Vietnam. Mm. Um, they, they, they like to spray Agent Orange around and uh, move people and kill people and generally have a good time. Um, they were protecting, of course, a colony which produced a large amount of the world's rubber, mm. uh, which, of course, uh, the British stole from Brazil. Uh, and of course, a massive amount of tin, um, which were the two products of, of Malaysia and pineapples. So yeah. they were protecting, <laughs> protecting their business. Um, and uh, so I, I, I lived there then and um, um, I, my parents, when I was about five, decided I should go to a boarding school up in the mountains in North Malaysia in an area called the Cameron Highlands. Uh, Cameron, I know it's a Scottish name, but somehow <laughs> that's where they were. And uh, so they, they took us to school. Uh, they flew us in, in, in Dakota airplanes to Ipoh. And then we then climbed into armored personnel carriers. And they took us through the jungle up to a uh, plateau, which was, which was where the school was. So um God. <laughs> yes and and we we had we had gurkha guards at the school um just just in case the the insurgents decided to attack us and um they, obviously we, we were not considered high value targets to use the modern nomenclature so they left us alone the, the scariest thing that ever happened was that one morning they found the tracks of a tiger going through the school playground and of course everybody panicked and uh, that was about the most exciting thing that happened. Um, it's quite interesting. Like how old were you then? Five. I first five. went to boarding school at five. So basically your parents just like more or less left you there. Yes. Yes. With my sister. Yes. So. Um, how did you feel? Did you have any earliest memories? Like, I mean, were you like, worried anxious angry 
Not really, no. I was, you know, I was curious. You know, there were a lot of things I didn't understand. That I wanted answers for, um, but no, it was, you know, normal life. And and of course, um, we moved from Johor, which is a town in the south of the peninsula, the Malaysian Peninsula, to mm. Singapore, mm. and to a bigger house, which of course. Um, but, you know, the, the, the most exciting thing I remember is things like the, the gardener killed a python with a spade and just dropped it in the dustbin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there were feral dogs in, in, around, you know, when you, you, called, uh, you called the city and they sent out a couple of guys with shotguns who shot the dogs. Um, the, the, you know, so I, I, I sort of moved around in, in the neighborhood and, and dealt with all sorts of people. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to go to a Chinese wedding and a Chinese funeral. And, um, and there was a house on the hill behind our house where the, what I refer to as the Indian bachelors lived. There was about five or 10 Indians there who, who lived in this house. And I would go up there early in the morning and drink coffee with them. My parents Whoa. would probably have died had they known. <laughs> <laughs> I also went into, there was a, a Malaysian village, uh, maybe a quarter mile away, half a mile away, and I'd go there and hang out there during the day too. So I spoke <laughs> fluent Malay, um, which of course, I now only remember the dirty words, which is usually what happens. <laughs> Take us a bit like more kind of insight about that. So how, what's the timeline you're talking about? This is a, well, I was born in 1947. Hmm. So I, I left, um, I left the, I left um, Malaysia a bit about 1953 or so. Hmm. Um, maybe a little later, and then went back to England. And at that time, unbeknownst to me, my parents were getting divorced. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, which was kind of rare in those days for people to get divorced. Yeah. Um, I, I then, so then of course I, uh, I went to a local day school, um, a Catholic day school. And then eventually I ended up going off to boarding schools. So I was in boarding schools most of my educational life. Um, I mean, I'm a bit curious, like in boarding school, does it mean like your parents were in the army or no? No, 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 no. People say to me, your parents are in the army. My father was in the army during World War II, but okay. afterwards, he, yeah. Um, no, no, there's just, you send the kids off to boarding school so you don't have to put up with them. Um, you know, it, it just, just the same, you, you know, either send the kids to boarding school or you have, a, you know, if you've got more money, you have a nanny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're living a life in the like fast lane. I mean, from the very beginning, <laughs> memories. Like, I mean, going to Singapore, going to Malaysia. I mean, during that time, it was quite, yeah. quite a thing, you know, from UK. Like during that time, it's the post Second World War, United Kingdom. So lots of you know things happening here. Um, yeah. Um. So you came back UK, and then how long did you stay in UK in that? Board? I stayed in the UK until I moved to um i moved to scandinavia in 1968. okay i first went to sweden mm -hmm. and then i went to denmark because denmark has better food better <laughs> beer and nicer looking <laughs> women <laughs> but i thought sweden is better than denmark for what i don't know but my my swedish students always talk about you know i mean denmark is yeah and don't go there yeah, there are a bunch of hippies. Yeah. So the, 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 the Swedes, you know, when I first arrived in Sweden, they had just finally got pubs. You could not get a beer in Sweden. And, and uh, you know, Norway still had dry counties too. So whereas Denmark um, has a more open culture and, you know, there's 24 hour eating and drinking, which Sweden did not have. So the Swedes used to go to Denmark to be naughty. It was, it was. <laughs> it's, 
it's just a breeze, isn't it? Just cross the breeze and then you're in. Yeah, yeah. now it's a bridge, but then it was a, there was a, 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 a boat. The bridge okay. is recent, yeah. Okay. Mm. So, like, I'm thinking of, like, you were more, like, 18, 20 years old around that. Yeah, time. yeah, in my 20s, early 20s, yeah. 20s, okay. Um, so, like, did you go to university here, or? No. No. Why you, why you did not go to university? Oh, that's one of those questions you have to <laughs> ask my, my family. <laughs> my father thought I was retarded. Uh, my father told people that I was not intelligent. My father didn't really think I had any hope. My sister was considered the smart one in the family. Mm. Um, so basically, it, it was not considered worthwhile putting any effort into my education or, or guidance. Mm. Um, but like normally, if students go to boarding school, yeah, so you then they get you, better education, isn't it? Exactly, you get better education, and and you will be you'll be coached in order to get in, and you know people will put an effort into it. As as I usually put it, someone will pick up the phone. Mm. Well, my father didn't pick up the phone. Um, my father said, "Boy, you have expensive tastes, uh, and you're idle. And the only suitable career I can think of for you is pimping." Oh my God. Yes. How did you feel about that? <laughs> Do I have to tell you? <laughs> this is awful. I mean, no. <laughs> did you like reconcile with your father about this? Never, never, <laughs> never. Um, I, 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 I never spoke to my father after about 1968 or so, before that, maybe 67. Mm. Um, I never spoke to him. Um, as I say, he he never did anything to to ensure that that uh, I had an easy passage in life, uh, unlike my sister. So, <laughs> so I basically made my own way. Wow. Um, so okay, tell us the next journey from Denmark, Sweden, and then where? I lived in Denmark for about ten years. I married a Danish woman, and. Uh, we both ended up in, in Los Angeles, mm. and I worked in, in, in Los Angeles um, for an extended period of time, mm. and then spent some time in Wisconsin and some time uh, back in Los Angeles, and then um, mm. I lived in Santa Barbara and you know um, the San Francisco Bay Area, and then in Oregon. The last place I was living was Oregon. My understanding about you is like you became a tech person, IT person. Yeah. When that thing happened? Um, well, I it happened started in Denmark. I, I, I worked for um, I worked for companies called Radiometer, for example, who um, did scientific and medical instrumentation. Um, I then also worked for a company making two-way radios called Neros. And uh, then uh, um, I I did a bit of work for uh, a, a studio that was uh, printing Cibachrome prints because I had some tech expertise in making sure all the equipment was running properly. And uh, then I went to the United States. Did you have any formal degree on? No, no, no. So want to know all... something? <laughs> I go to the library and get the book. <laughs> but that's quite interesting. Because your your father told you that you are idle and you, yes, you... I, late, late, yeah, idle and 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 have expensive tastes. Yeah, yeah, but I should basically like... be in the ponce business. Yeah, <laughs> but but you went to the library. Yes, yes. <laughs> if we, you know, I mean. You know, one of the wonderful things about libraries, if you have a question, and this was before the internet, if you have a question, okay. the answer is in a library. Yeah. And, and, you know, you just need to know how to navigate the library and whether that's the, you know, card index catalog or the interlibrary loan or what have you. For yeah. example, in Copenhagen, um, there was some question about the, the, the book, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, mm. which, which is this wonderful forgery about how the Jews are basically taking over the world. And um, I, I got a copy of it in Denmark. 
I, I actually went to the, the National Library mm. and asked for it, an interlibrary loan, and they wouldn't lend it to me until the, the librarian who was in charge of Judica and the, you know, the Jewish literature came down and talked to me and asked me why I wanted to read it. And I explained I wanted to read it because I really wanted to know what this whole thing was about and how, you know, how believable was it. Mm. And I borrowed a copy from, I think it was a library in Bradford, England, was shipped mm. all the way over to Copenhagen for me to read, which is the thing I love about libraries. <laughs> yeah, because they care about knowledge, isn't it? They, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and when I was in Oregon, there was a book I wanted to read, which which um, was published in Pakistan. And I think there was a copy somewhere in the Library of Congress or somewhere, and I got a copy, but I had to sit down and read it in the library, which was a good thing. It wasn't a very long book. Mm. And then it went back. So yes, if you want anything, if you know how to navigate this system, and it's not hard because that's what librarians are there for, yeah. to help you, you can get any question answered. Want to build a nuclear bomb? You can get the book. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there now. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was watching Oppenheimer, kind of growing up in a very, you know, it's, it's a quite a time, isn't it? It's the Vietnam War happening. When I was living in Denmark, in the midst of the Vietnam War thing, I thought the United States could have collapsed in five days. It was that much on the edge. You were following what's going on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. outside Denmark. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Was it very common during that time? Your generation were very switched on to what's going on in, in the name of Cold War. I can tell you that the people I hung out with did. I can't tell you about, you know, it's all the, it's the, yeah. you know, it's always the birds of a feather thing, you know, like the people mm -hmm. you know, are the people mm -hmm. who have the same sort of beliefs and, and, and interests as you. Mm -hmm. So, um, certainly, you know, I mean, we'd sit around on a Saturday night and this is the sort of thing we'd discuss. Mm. So most of the news you got is from newspaper, radio, like what, what was going on in like Denmark in terms of... Uh, my days? sources of information were the BBC, mm. uh, Radio Moscow, uh, <laughs> Radio Netherlands. <laughs> Um, sometimes bits of Radio Sweden, and then, of course, newspapers and magazines. And, and newspapers were, were freely available. Mm. Um, you know, you could go to the library and get them, or you could, a lot of restaurants had, you know, the daily newspaper. Yeah, mm. just... So it, it sounds like during that time, you were already tuned in for your political awareness. I lived in a, I lived, my, my, my father was a conservative. Mm. and and a a a member of the Carlton Club. Um, so politics were very much a daily thing. Mm. Um, My understanding about you is like, in your life, you moved towards more to the left. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm just wondering whether, you know, any like psychological things going on there, like your father, so you, you try to be, like whatever your father said, so you just went against everything. Not necessarily. Um, when I grew up, the, the, the Conservative Party were, you know, um, far to the left of Keir Starmer. Yeah, yeah. That's you true. know, yeah. <laughs> things were different, very different, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but, but, you know, also, I mean, I, I, I lived in Scandinavia, which, is, which has got a completely different political system. They have proportional representation, things like that. Mm. And um, they, you know, I, I saw different political systems. I, of course, <clears throat> stayed very much on top of world news. Mm. It, was, it was an interest of mine. And one thing that I, 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 I figured out in those days was that at any one time, there are 15 or more low-level wars or insurgencies going on, whether they're in, in Burma or Myanmar, as we call it, Cambodia, mm. um, you know, um, Pakistan, um, all of those things. There's always something like that going on. And, and mm. even today, you know, I, I, I probably don't follow it as closely as I used to as a younger man, but, mm. you know, there's, there's, there's always some sort of crap going on. Mm.
Mm. And, uh, you know, um, Latin America, for example, was under continual turmoil. Mm. Um, you mm. know, we, 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 we remember uh, Argentina and Chile, but we forget, you know, Guatemala and all these other places. I remember following the Sunday Times, Times had a, a multi-week um, expose of what was going on in, in, in Latin America and all the uh, airplanes flying down from the United States and changing their tail numbers as they hopped from country to country. <laughs> I'm just like trying to follow your timeline more in a like structured way. Um, so you went to America, that's like 1977? Seven. Seven. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So Carter was there. That's oh, right. Yeah. What's your memory about Jimmy Carter? Um, I have had nothing but good things to say about Jimmy Carter from day one. Mm. Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter um, represented everything that Americans hate. <laughs> he wanted to move over to alternative fuels. Mm. He put solar panels on top of the White House, which Ronald Reagan took down. Um, he oh. basically was he 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 gave a big talk about you know Americans are wasting energy and that's one of the things you'll find about America energy is cheap mm. and when it's cheap you piss it away mm. Mm. you know and and as a, a I had a friend in Los Angeles who was a, um, a a an officer in the German Luftwaffe uh, he was working at, in in Los Angeles on the the GPS system mm. um, and, and he said about his house, it's like heating a tent. <laughs> it's like there was no insulation. You just turn up the heat. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and insulation was, you know, it was a sign of, you know, I think it was a sign of moral weakness if you insulated your house. I don't know, but people didn't really bother in those days. <laughs> um, I mean, I actually never knew that. I mean, Carter was very conscious about, you know, this like, climate stuff you know yeah oh yeah oh well. yeah 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 mm. way ahead of his time way ahead of his time you know mm. yeah and 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 that was the, like i mean fascinating story he put a solar panel on on, on the roof of the white house which reagan took down <laughs> uh, i mean i've been reading politics for some time i actually never came across that that story i mean that, that's that's mm. amazing story i mean um, yeah like when it was taken down by Reagan, I mean, well, what was going on in terms of public discourse? I mean, I mean, nobody cared, you know, nobody really cared about energy or saving energy or having a future. That's never been on the cards. Um, mm. You know, those, don't forget in those days, that's when Exxon knew we were, we were in trouble with CO2. Exxon knew. Mm. And unfortunately, in those days, I... <clears throat> I worked. Uh, I worked for Exxon in those days. <laughs> <laughs> I, I worked for a company that Exxon owned, mm. which was the Exxon because there were people were scared of Carter, and and the the companies that were making money in the in the um, military industrial complex mm. and and petroleum and stuff were scared. So they were trying to diversify. So Exxon decided to get into office equipment. So they, Exxon started <laughs> selling fax machines, typewriters, and stuff like that. And they also, they bought a company that was developing what has now become voicemail. And this was the first voicemail system. They wow. bought that company called Delphi Communications. Mm. And I went and worked for them. Mm. And, and it gave me a lot of insight into the way large Fortune 500 companies think. Mm. It's all about the money. Mm. And to tell you how it's all about the money, we, we, because we, we were working with all this telephone equipment, we tapped the CEO's office telephone just for entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> and he spent his work day talking to his broker about his personal account. Oh, my God. That's what his work day consisted of. And this is where it got, I got insight that these hardworking executives are not hardworking executives. They're just a bunch of grifters. 
and they just like have this insider knowledge and then just yeah just and, and connections and most of them you know most ceos have no freaking idea what business they're in mm, mm. someone from nabisco the biscuit company at one time ran ibm now can you show, tell me the difference between a large mainframe computer and a biscuit <laughs> <laughs> and basically, the, you know, if you're a CEO, you're just a CEO. You, you mm -hmm. don't know anything about the business. And, and this is an illustration of that. I have, you know, in my life met all sorts of people like that who have these high positions. I remember talking to an executive from <clears throat> TRW, and he did not know that TRW made semiconductors. Well, what are you doing all day? <laughs> <laughs> So he was the CEO of. <laughs> it was a VP, yeah, and he didn't know what, didn't know what business. They don't know what business they're in. It's not really about business. It's more about chuck and jive, as I put it. Mm, mm. So, so you know, you, like, what's your understanding about this? Like this, like the rise of CEOs. I mean, yeah, why they are first of all, you know, employed, and then why they earn serious amount of money. And it looks like what you are saying, these people are extremely incompetent. They have got yes, as a general rule, they are, yes. <laughs> um, so then why these people are hired? Is that is because of their connection with the Yeah, it's dogs? it's a lot of it's a lot of its connections and a lot of it is the culture. There is a company called Hayes, H A Y S, mm. and their business is to advise companies on how much they should pay senior executives. And how does this work? Well, they say, well, so-and-so down the road is getting 20 million. So if you pay less, you won't get the good people. And so they, they will tell you that if you want the best CEOs, you really have to pay them well. Mm. Yeah, if they could do that with plumbers, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> but th this is the myth, and, and, and they live by it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, when you look at things like Hunter Biden's son, uh, Hunter Biden, the, the President Biden's son, had this job with an oil company paying illegal sums of money to him in Romania. Was it Romania? Anyhow, uh, it's like, what does he know about the oil business? Nothing. You don't have to know anything. Mm. And, and, you know, Exxon is run by accountants. They make decisions on money. They don't make decisions on product. Mm -hmm. And and you know you look at you look at companies, car companies. You think, why don't they make this car anymore? Well, that was a money decision. That wasn't a question of the market or what people want or what works best. It's a question mm -hmm. of how much money do we get out of this. This is why in America mm -hmm. they like to build pickup trucks because they 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 make the most money. Mm -hmm. They're not the best cars. Mm. They got the highest profit. Mm. Mm. Like I'm just like I'm a bit interested about you know your background like Sussex, Denmark, Malaysia, and other places, and then suddenly you are in America. <laughs> yeah. um, what was happening in your you know in mind? my head? Okay, yeah. very simple. If if you look at if you look at um if you look at America in in the 60s and 70s, mm. they were the manufacturing powerhouse. Everything mm. was made in America. Now nothing's made in America, but then everything. Mm. They owned the semiconductor industry. Mm. They owned the car industry. Mm. They owned pretty much everything but watches, although they didn't make a watch, but they, they, they made everything. Mm. And they were the leaders. Mm. And they were, the, they were the standard that people aspired to. Mm. They made big refrigerators, they made air conditioners, they made all this stuff. Mm, mm. So, and, I mean, uh, so if you try to pinpoint your career trajectory, like, I mean, yeah. how did you define yourself? Like, I mean, what kind of expertise you had when you moved to America? Um, I had, I had a pretty good expertise in, in electronics. Okay. Um, and, uh, and and how easy it was for you to you know get a job in America? Did you get a job oh. offer before or once? When you I went to America, you could pretty much knock on any door and start work. 
Because America then was the manufacturing powerhouse of the world. So there was a continual talent shortage. Mm. Then, of course, it all, they, the, then, of course, the, the, the spreadsheet boys came in and said, look, you know, it costs $5 to make this in America, and we can make it in Taiwan for three. That means we can put $2 in our pocket because nothing ever got cheaper, you notice. Mm. It was mm. more cheaply made, it was crappier, but it costs the same. Yeah. So, yeah. so the manufacturing industry shut down and shut down across the United States. And we talk about the Rust Belt, yeah. all that heavy industry that just went away. Mm. And everything went away. And, you know, electronics was, was in the, the West Coast and, and, you know, it just went away. Everything mm. went away. And, and so basically, I arrived and, and the joke I was put is, you know, people said, oh, McCassie's just arrived. Let's shut everything down. Because that's what happened. Everything, you know, everything mm. shut down. Mm. Because like in my private conversation with you, you mentioned about, you know, how like, you know, this hire and fire policy is just throughout mm -hmm. your career. So the yeah. amount of time you lost your jobs, you, you just could not count even. That's right. That's right. That's true. <laughs> And, and that's that's true for most people in, in, in the United States. The, the United States used to be much like the other countries while, while it was still the manufacturing powerhouse. You left, you know, school or university or wherever you were and you started a job and you could stay there until you retired. You got a pension, you got health care, you got everything. That's gone away. That doesn't exist anymore. Mm, mm. Everything's kind of day to day. Mm. So like if you try to like if i try to you know quantify the timeline is it like from reagan's like you know reagan is the starting point to demise the reagan administration yeah well somewhat before that and i think you know as i say i think i think carter terrified terrified um you know wall street terrified because carter said we're doing it wrong <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is, in other words, wrong from the perspective: Are we, you know, are we we working towards a bet, a healthier, better America, mm, mm. or are we working towards, you know, a, a richer America? And mm. and um, Carter cared about these things, and uh, that's why he served one term. And uh, <laughs> um, because, like, I'm I'm quite because I teach Middle East politics, like one of the like moment like you know this hostess crisis in tehran yes yes um what's your memory about that a uh, very 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 much i remember that for many reasons um and um you know there were there were demonstrations in the streets of los angeles by iranians mm. you know against the, the Shah mm. um, and, and Savak, which was the, 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 the secret yeah, police. Secret police, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, th there was obviously this groundswell against the Shah and, and um, the fact that he was installed by the CIA, um, Kermit Roosevelt. Mm. Mm. Um, and so he was held in place because, you know, and Iran or Persia was always a source of oil. In fact, that's where British Petroleum comes from, mm. as I'm sure you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and so it was, it, it was, you know, before Saudi Arabia came on the scene, it was a, a major supplier of mm. oil. And mm. uh, the, the British were very much dependent upon that oil. And that's why Churchill changed all the ships from coal to oil. Um, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so then, you know, it, Iran's collapsing. And of course, you can imagine everyone's terrified by this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, you're losing, you're losing something you had good control over. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that was, that was basically what happened. They lost, the, 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 mm -hmm. the West lost control of it, of Iran. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, so, it's like, I mean, it's like, sounds like, you know, you're talking about CEOs. That CEOs mm -hmm. have got no control about their or knowledge about their product. Mm -hmm. So the people who are in power, they've got no knowledge about what's going on on the ground. 
the actors. No, they have very little understanding. I mean, I've had enough conversations and, you know, I've had conversations like talking to, to CEOs about the difficulty of running a company from a different country because the cultures are so different. Mm -hmm. And they look at me like I just arrived from Mars. Like, what do I know? Like, <laughs> I think that's the, like empire's kind of, you know, like arrogance. You know, I don't need to know. Yes, yes, to yeah, know. exactly, can, exactly. Can fix it. And, 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 you know, I am, I am a product of the British Empire. Mm. Mm. You know, my, my parents met in India, mm. where my mother was a nurse and my father was in the, what was called the Indian Army, which is what it says on my birth Whoa. certificate. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, and I, I, I watched the British Empire collapse mm. and watching my father, you know, rail about this over his whiskey and soda, how basically Britain had fucked up India by mm. pulling out and, you know, mm. India would be in much better shape if Britain was still running things. Uh, it's just there in the brain, isn't it? We had the empire, you know, so the losing right. empire doesn't make sense in their brain. Yeah, they, they don't say... What were we doing there? Mm. <laughs> it's like you would say, what are we doing there? Why are we there? Mm. And and the, the only reason basically is 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 for for production mm. of whatever it may be, you know. And and uh, you know, like as I explained about, you know, the, the, the purpose of Malaysia was, you know, tin and rubber. And and India provided cotton and uh, you mm. know various foodstuffs and things like that. But you know, it, it's, it's, you know, and, and sort of, we, we, we have this sort of legacy of products that we get from empire. Mm. And when we lose empire, things get all messed up and, and everybody gets confused. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, Chomsky was saying in one of his, his speeches, um, when China, you know, moved from the previous regime to Mao Zedong's revolutionary mm -hmm. China, the first Telegram came from, I think, from Peking to Washington, D.C. It just one line. It said, we just lost China That's as right. if America owned China. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, I tried to see it like through the lens of that understanding about the yeah. other. So like Iran was, I think, the similar situation. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. America was must have been furious. That they put mm -hmm. our people in a hostile situation. And I that's think right. the TV channels were counting the days, I still remember. That's right. That's right. Uh, it, it, they, 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 had, they had a special program on TV every night about the Iran Costa thing. And it was like, that's now become the late night TV program that didn't exist before that. Late night news did not exist until the Iran hostage crisis. Wow. I didn't know that. And like one of the theory, I mean, it's, it's not, first, lots of people say that it's conspiracy theory because Obviously, Carter was trying his best to release them before the election. And right. Not. And that's right. one of the reasons, like, Reagan, more or less. And the, the conspiracy is like, conspiracy theory is like, the Republican Party put money on the table on the Iranian side that don't release them mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the election. Because they the cut election. deals. Yeah. 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 And then the day Reagan you know, took his oath, the presidential, you know. They were let go. Yeah. Yeah. On that day, the hostages flew to, yes, I think JFK Airport. I mean, on the same day, right. So those are like conspiracy. But I mean, did you have any memories about those things? What yes, I did, and there was no question about the fact that it was a deal, you know. And and um, um, you know, it, it it was it was done to to manipulate the election. Leads me into the there is no democracy. Um, <laughs> it's not the will of the people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Americans still can't point to Iran on the map, you know. <laughs> and of course, because Iran has a nuclear program, the arrogance of the United States is how dare you have a nuclear program without our permission? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why do you need permission of the United States? You know, there's only <laughs> one country that's ever used a nuclear weapon. Yeah. Um, 
but I mean, the, the story is during the, during the time of Shah, when Shah was yeah. the king. Yeah, yeah. Drake actually proposed to him, do you want nuclear weapons? And he says that, no, I don't, know, I don't need it. <laughs> so from there, now they cannot have it because, you know, yeah. Yeah. this regime is not my people. So it's but, just the people, the, isn't it? The United States was selling an enormous amount of weapons to the Iranians, just like they sell them to the Saudis in those mm -hmm. days. Mm. including hovercraft. They had hovercraft for patrolling the Persian Gulf. Mm. Yes, I don't know if they've ever been used, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They bought a ton of them. Mm. Mm. So. Because, I mean, that, that, like, those kind of, you know, events, more or less triggered, you know, once the revolution happened, then, you know, then I think the West hired Saddam Hussein that, you know, can you fix this? Because, you know, how dare yeah. you know, it became yeah. something yeah. else. Um, yeah. and, and there's a funny story because, I mean, Iran just like came out from this revolution. So there's nothing there yeah. in the Iranian side in terms of army totally, you know, dismantled, you know, everything is gone. Right, right. Um, and during that time, because obviously Saddam thought that, yeah, I could finish it anytime. We could so, take care of this, yeah, yeah. And I think there's a famous speech he gave to his army generals. The speech was the one line he used is, we will be in Tehran in 72 hours. Yeah. He was fighting for eight years. He was nowhere near there. Yeah, I know, was, I know. He was because extreme. mainly, <laughs> you, you know, there's, there's several things about warfare which are true. One of them is trench warfare never goes anywhere. Yeah. And the other one is, it's very difficult to beat an insurgency. Mm, mm. You look historically at insurgencies, and you know the last one we had to deal with was called Afghanistan. Mm. Um, you can't beat them because mm. you know. And and the quote that I love to use is: is someone asked the when when Cyprus was was you know at war trying to get independence, and someone said you know to the mayor of Nicosia, who's in Ioka? He said, "We're all in Ioka. I'm in Ioka." We're all members of EOKA. You know, we may not be combatants, but we all, you know, we're on their side. And, you know, the, 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 the Iran Iraq conflict was, was ridiculous. It's just unbelievable. And, and, yeah. And, and for you know, eight years. Fueled yes. by the United States. I mean, you know, you, the, where were they getting their weapons from? Mm. Mm. As, as we we're learning right now in the Ukraine, weapons are disposables. The life expectancy of, of vehicles in combat is like 10 hours or something. It's, you know, you, you need to replace all this stuff all the time. A couple of things, like, I mean, lots of books written on that. So once the Iran-Iraq war started in the 10 Downing Street, Thatcher said to, his, to her cabinet during that time, is like, basically how to make money from this war. <laughs> because like two oil-rich countries are doing this, you know, Absurd right. war, and then no, no one has got any clue, but we can milk it to the very end. Yes, and I think that inspired other countries as well. So I think during the Iran Iraq war, at least fifty countries sold weapons to both sides. Not oh, only. that's the best part. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And 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 it was George Orwell who said. Mm that war only starts when the money classes think they can make money at it. Mm, mm. And I think that that made Iran-Iraq war, I mean, so protracted because, I mean, like at one point, Saddam Hussein, I think after two years, said, you know what, I stop this nonsense, you know? And right. basically he was told that, no, you cannot stop it, man. That's right. Keep going. And, and keep going. Keep going. Um, and, and I think, and you can see lots of bad things happen. And, and the very thing the empire wanted is the collapse of Iran, mm -hmm. more or less solidify Iran. So the Iran right now is, is the product of that thing. Mm -hmm. The very thing the West wanted, they just had the just opposite things happen. So the history stayed with Iran, Iranian revolution, rather than you know whatever they try to do. So I mm -hmm. think part of me like thing that it's like bad faith. So the West never had a good faith on, on, on those wars because the, the original position was never being to like, you know, justice or fairness or like, you know, 
peace is mm-hmm. is about making money, making profit. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, and and the whole thing's about money. Mm, mm. And and the whole thing about I mean the whole thing about the Cold War was money. Mm, mm. Let's face it. You know, do you seriously think that Moscow was planning and marching on the West? Why would they want to do that? But we had this this whole propaganda mm. that this is what the Soviet Union wanted to do was destroy the West. Mm. And 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 Khrushchev, when he said we will bury you, what he basically said was, you know, we'll be here when you 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 you're gone. Unfortunately, that wasn't true, but because the U.S. piled everything they had into destroying the Soviet Union, but mm-hmm. this was just—it was just a shadow boxing. There was no, there was no, you know, you're starving our people and we won't let you do it, sort of thing. It was mm-hmm. just, you know, and and um, the Reagan Star Wars thing, which was this whole—we're going to come up with these great weapons to kick the ass of the Soviet Union. And uh, they, they made some fantastic stuff, which was totally unusable, but a great idea. Um, and and I, I saw some of this stuff being demonstrated on, on film in, in those mm. days at the Reagan era. Mm. Fascinating stuff. But, you know, why? Because they're just spending money. Mm. In terms of your going back to the memory lane, I mean, yeah. when Reagan got his second term. Yeah. What were you thinking? Like, you know, so... This guy who's destroying more or less everything, even mm-hmm. in America, um, it seems like he's very popular. And all this criminality you know, is happening during his time, and and in the it goes on in the like second term. Um, yes, yes, and, and Nicaragua, for example. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, the, 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 you know as as I said earlier, you know, the United States continues to interfere with with South America. That's mm-hmm. what they do. Mm. And it, it's something that they call manifest destiny. In other words, God has given them this big piece of real estate to to make sure that they're behaving properly. Because you saw the both world, Cold War and the post Cold War. Yeah. I mean, how do you compare contrast? Like, I mean, which one is the worst out of these two? In terms which of one? our, you know, the existential situation that you know in during the cold war it's almost like anything can happen anytime and that's the end um but nothing happened right um, and the post cold war it looks like you know things are or you know things are now sorted because that's the end of history so francis fukuyama's you know the idea about you know we moved on so the western yeah. liberal democracy is the king so we don't need to worry about anything else yeah right yeah <laughs> yeah um, so if you compare this two era, I mean, what, what's your understanding? Like when you were more worried? I was never actually worried, worried about the Cold War because, you know, there was a lot of it was mostly saber rattling. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the United States and, and NATO uh, spent an enormous amount of money just sort of touching the borders of, of of the the Soviet Union, and uh, you know, obviously they they were in Turkey. Turkey is a member of NATO, not because mm. it's near the North Atlantic, but because it's bordered the Soviet bordered Union. Soviet Union. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and and so so you know, we, we we even had you know, in Pakistan, watching the Soviet Union, there was. The, U-2s were flying out of there. And the United States has had a, a military presence in Pakistan since the beginning of the Cold War. Mm. We don't talk about it, but it's there. In fact, mm. the drones that have been flying over Afghanistan and killing people in sandals, obviously a major threat to the, to, <laughs> to the good order of the West. Mm. They're all coming out of a, a, a military US Air Force base there. Mm. Mm. So post the Cold War, the amount of military spending and conflict has not changed. Mm. Just the, the, the players on the board have changed. So for example, 
the post 9-11, all that expenditure, you know, we're still spending as much money, but now mm. we're not fighting evil communists. Now we're fighting terrorists. <laughs> it's just the name, the brand change. You know? Right, exactly. We just, we just changed the players on the board. And now we're fighting terrorists and, and it's like people are frightened of terrorists and, and, you know, you know, see the fear in people's eyes in America when you use the magic, magic word Muslim, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> they, they, they're, they're frightened of these people because that's the propaganda they're given. Mm. And and that sort of keeps the whole thing on the boil. Mm. And and you know, the United States still has, you know, a big naval presence in, in the Gulf. Yeah, yeah. And 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 a big naval presence in the Mediterranean. Mm. And mm. you know, they, they they're terrified and remain the United States remains terrified that communists are going to take over and kill them all in their beds. <laughs> um you no know, it kind of makes sense like when your populace becomes terrified about something which you don't have much knowledge right but your head of state or your you know the the big state mechanism more or less tells these things again and again you right. kind of believe it and then you know obviously state has got different type of interest so it makes sense when they spend like eight trillion dollar on this war on terror for last 20 years so the brown right. university did a serious research on that so this war actually killed more than a million yeah people oh, yeah. civilians yeah. we're talking yeah. about yeah. and america went after this like 12 countries and these 12 countries are 99% are actually Muslim countries because, you know, right. so you, you tick all the boxes and, and then went after those. So these are the poorest of the poor countries in the world. Exactly. Who really, and, they just, they just want three meals a day and a place to sleep. Yeah. So if you just give them $8 trillion, I mean, they, they could be like Singapore now, yeah. all 12 of them. $8 trillion is a big, big money you're talking about. That's a lot of yeah. zeros, as I say. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I don't know like whether they spent like eight trillion worth of money during the Cold War even. Just like the Cold War spent an enormous to... amount of money, you know, mm -hmm. over the years. And and you know, the, the, the and of course everybody was brought into this. But you know, the sort of thing about propaganda and bullshit, uh, mm -hmm. when Reagan was in power, there was this whole thing about the Libyan hit team. You can probably Google yeah. this. Yeah. And it's like there was supposed to be, I think, six or 12 Libyans somewhere in the United States, we're not sure where, who were there to assassinate President Reagan. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> Unfortunately, we never found these Libyans. We have no idea where they are. They're probably running a kebab shop somewhere today. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they must be very old now, isn't it? They're probably very, probably, yeah, they're probably been pensioned off. Who knows? <laughs> but, you know, this was the Libyan hit team. And they make up this stuff and everybody goes, oh my God, you know, we're all going to die. <laughs> it's crap. But also it's kind of like Kafka's kind of understanding about the whole thing. Because Reagan was, you know, hit by someone who is not actually from Libya, but their own people. Pre Vice President Bush's friend was okay. Mr. Hinckley and his son was the one that tried to kill Reagan. <laughs> And the story was he did that to impress Jodie Foster, oh my who ironically God. Yeah. happens to be a lesbian. When you think about it, how do we know that he didn't do it, hoping his dad will become the president? Wouldn't that be a better scenario? <laughs> oh, yeah. So unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah. And, you know, so this, have you ever seen um, a, a, I think it's a three-part television series called The Power of Nightmares. Yeah, yeah. So I, I actually used it for my fourth year's course. Yeah. So this is like Adam Curtis' like That's right. documentary. Yeah. Uh, it's, and it's, kind of explains crazy. that if crazy. you can make the people frightened, they'll do anything. Yeah, yeah.
Um, because, I mean, so when you talk about they spend billions of dollars in the Cold War and the billions of dollars, trillions of dollars in the like post-Cold War, so obviously we, do, we did not see any kind of evidence that where it was spent, I mean, but it looks like money went somewhere, isn't it? Yeah. yeah the money goes to Switzerland, I think. Usually that's where money goes when we can't find it. <laughs> 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 You know, you look at the, you look at, you know, and, 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 and get back to Carter. One of the things that, you know, Carter scared all these companies, General Dynamics, which is a, a, an arms manufacturer. They make cruise missiles and tanks and stuff. Um, interesting history of that company. Um, they ended up buying a company making telephones mm -hmm. uh, because they were trying to diversify away from from making bombs and associated equipment. And so I ended up working for one of these companies called American Telecommunications Incorporated. And we made the Mickey Mouse telephone. So the people who were making cruise missiles also owned the company that made Mickey Mouse telephones because they were trying to diversify away from <laughs> the, 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 the bomb, you know, the, the death and destruction business, because yeah. those people were worried that Carter was going to shut down their gig. Mm. So, so Exxon was making office equipment. General Dynamics was making Mickey Mouse telephones. Reagan came into office. They divested themselves from these. They just mm. shut them down and sold them, got rid of them. Mm. They went, oh, don't have to worry about that anymore. We're back to we're back to the death and destruction business. Mm -hmm. so. so, so like for Carter, it's not only the. It seems like there's a serious problem. I mean, Carter did not do any bad things for, you know, no. he, he had no good faith intentions as well. Yes, he was a very good man, and he wanted to make America a better place, mm. not a richer place for the people with the money, but a better place. Mm. Uh, you know, he wanted to go go into alternate energy, and that included shale oil. Interestingly, mm. uh, you know, which of now is is what the fracking business has become. But he he wanted to wanted to make America a better place with less pollution and uh, alternative energy, and uh, you know, mm. all that good stuff. And he wanted to regulate things, which of course upsets everybody. <laughs> Hmm, hmm. What's your assessment about Ronald Reagan? Because he's a Hollywood guy, isn't he? So obviously he has got no knowledge about politics that much. So which is a very good choice, the people who will try to manipulate him. He was the head of the Screen Actors Guild for a while, the, the Actors Trade Union. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so from there to like Frederick Hayek, free market economy. <laughs> yeah. And and you know. He, he, he was, so he's very, he was very interested in politics, which mm. is why he, he, he was in the union. He also became the governor of California. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he was also responsible while he was a governor for the, for the West thing of like closing mental institutions and deciding that mental health is not really a problem and we can handle it by giving people happy pills. And so that pharmaceuticals also make money from this as well. Everybody makes, yeah, of course, everybody makes money. Come on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, but not only the making money, but the fact that this was no longer a government expense. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things about mental institutions is really there's a couple of places that do take people privately, but nowadays they mainly do drug rehab for, r drug rehab for rich people who have prob problems with their personal demons, mm -hmm. unlike chemical dependency, which is what poor people have. Basically, they've shut all that down, saved all the money. Mm. But I mean, what do you think? Like, what what really worked for Reagan? It seems like lots of bad things he was, you know, trying to give to America. But most of these products were just like for the rich people. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And 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 the people, the mass, more or less accepted that position. Yes because he's keeping America safe. Okay. Did he? Well, apparently he, he attacked Libya, didn't he? <laughs> the reason they attacked Libya is that 
Gaddafi, you know, was was slightly to the left, and this yeah. was an untenable yeah. position. And also during that time, Gaddafi was close friend to Yasser Arafat. Yeah, he was. He was. He was happy. He was. He was close friends with all sorts of people on the left, and also there was some continual stories about him supporting the IRA. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that CIA created some kind of, you know, paranoia about that. You know, there is a kind of collusion among PLO, Libya, and IRA. Um, and I think, I mean, there's a couple of documentary on those things. And, and, and when it was given to, I think, Ronald Reagan, he actually really believed that. And then, you know, obviously they're trying to put resources for this, like, you know, so-called fear. And yeah. when it went to CIA, and CIA chief told that, I mean, the whole story was created by them. Yes. So well, now that, they, they want CIA to do something about that. But the problem right. is CIA created that whole myth. That's how you do it. <laughs> that's, that's the way you do these things, is you create this rumor, you put it out there, and then have some come back and tell you that rumor, which then proves it. <laughs> And then, because the CIA chief was you know, reluctant to do anything, Reagan, what he did, he changed the CIA chief during that time and got very this old guy as a CIA chief. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. then, you know, resources funded for those mythical threat. I mean, you know, it's the whole power nightmares thing and, and the whole, you know, Reagan, Reagan was constantly keeping America safe from, you know, threats like Libya. Um, mm. And, and, you know, we're currently continually worried about North Korea and all these mm. other places, but they just, they just want to get along. They just, you know, they, they, they don't have a fight. I mean, it's, it's quite interesting, like the way America kind of, you know, the thought process is like, you know, people will attack them. But historically, it's not true. They attack them. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So the whole, you know, this fear mechanism is built on myth. And, and you just play this myth again and again, and then more or less you believe that myth. And one of the things I, I try to explain, like whenever I talk in public places, that during this, like the first Gulf War, 1991, the coalition casualties was just like 150. And out of 150 casualties is like 35% where I think it's called fatricide. Basically, you know, they kill themselves. They, they, they call it friendly fire. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and the, from Iraqi side, no one has got any idea that how many people got killed. The Some yeah. of the closest estimate is like over 100,000. So like, I mean, how does it work? So what kind of war is that? You know, you lose well, that, 10 soldiers yeah. and 100,000. And that's mainly because, you know, you go in and you basically lay waste to an area and then you march in. Mm. So you're not street, you're not shooting, you know, street to street. Mm. And, and that's, that's pretty much, you know, and like, you'll see this in Iraq, you know, it's like when, when it came to Iraq the second time, you know, these convoys come in with mm. guys with machine guns pointed 360 degrees and anyone looks like they're moving, you shoot them. Mm. Mm. And it shows, you know, the, the, the firepower of the empire. I mean, if you look at the casualties, I mean, any kind of war, America is involved. Like, even if you look at the Korean War, I think the, the, the lowest estimate is like close to I think, three, four million people died in the Korean War. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at like Vietnam War, another, you know, a couple of millions. The Iraq war, close to a million. Afghanistan, yeah. no one knows like what really happened there. I yeah. mean, it's just unbelievable. You know, just the threats. We are talking about the threat perception, how it works. Like when like you are killing this amount of people and you still kind of saying that, you know, we are under threat. Mm -hmm. They want to kill us, but historically you have been killing them. That's right. That's right. And of course you know you have to remember you went into their country they didn't come into your country mm. Mm. you know the, the, you look at the history of the united states you know the 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 only 
sort of, you know, the, there was Pearl Harbor and Americans bang on about Pearl Harbor and ignore the fact that on the same day, mm. the Japanese invaded Malaysia and the Philippines. Mm. No one ever talks about that. Mm. And they made one raid on Pearl Harbor and that was it. They were done. And then there was a submarine that shelled Santa Barbara, California, a Japanese submarine. Mm. And there was the fire, the fire balloons. And that was, that was the amount of incursion from Japan into the United States in World War II. Also, American made lots of Hollywood films on that, you know, right? Oh, yeah. Tell that story. I mean, how big that attack was. Uh, mm -hmm. It was like 45 <laughs> minutes or something. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a like, uh, famous like philosopher, a French philosopher who was teaching in, I think, Berkeley University during the first Gulf War. And I mean, he was obviously frightened about the whole kind of, you know, discourse happening during that time, because it was the easiest thing to stop the war. I mean, just Bush just could have called Saddam Hussein and then just, just go away. And then he yeah. could have gone away <laughs> rather than, you know, they try to maximize the situation. I mean, there's a... There's one documented uh, history, actually, you know, it says like James Baker was the foreign minister during that time, like for mm -hmm. foreign secretary. And the first thing he did after, like once invasion happened, he went to this, like they called it Tin Cup Tour. So Tin Cup Tour is, he got it like, you know, this kind of donation money, went mm -hmm. to like Saudi Arab first and asked Saudis, can you give me $20 billion? Because Saudi Arabia was frightened about Saddam Hussein, though mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein God has nothing, but more or less America showed them that this guy will come after you. That's right. And, You're next. And, yeah. and, and, and Saudis were, you know, not stupid. They're a bit clever during that time, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, so they said that, yeah, I'll give you 20 billion if the host country like Kuwait also mm -hmm. paid 20 billion. So that's 40 yeah. billion yeah. straight away. And then he went to Japan and Germany. And since Japan and Germany, because of the Second World War, you know, contractual obligation, they could not contribute right. soldiers. They asked them, can you give us some billions? And then I think he raised 16 billion from those two countries. So like 40 billion and 16 billion makes it 56 billion. And the whole cost of that, that first Gulf War from America's side is 62 billion. So if you compare this war with Vietnam War, it's a free war for America. 90% mm -hmm. money was already raised. Um, but I, I just don't know, like, these are like, you know, totally unaccounted money. Obviously, a big chunk of the money went to the military industrial complex. And, and even if you like, you know, 56 billion, if you can just take out 1 billion, and you know, spread out among your friends, that's, that's a good money. Isn't it? There's a lot about that first Gulf War that's interesting. One of them is that uh, the U.S. ambassador to Iraq at that time was a woman called April something or other. Yeah, April Glasby. Yeah, and she's on the record as saying to Hussein that if he invaded Kuwait, the United States was not interested. So he wouldn't have gone in had they said, if you move in there, we're going to, you know, we're going to lay waste to your country. Mm. He wouldn't have done it. Mm. But they, they, the United States tends not to keep its promises. And you can ask the people in Hungary about this, and you ask people in Czechoslovakia about this, you can ask people in Vietnam about this, they don't keep their promises. They say to other countries, we'll do this for you, or we're on your side, but they're not. And the same thing with, with, with Saddam Hussein and Kuwait. Kuwait's a little tiny country. When I went to school, Kuwait was a British protectorate. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it was it, it was created because it was like part of Basra. So what they did, I mean, they kind of yeah carved it so that you know Iraq doesn't have full access to the Persian Gulf, and That's right. that angered Iraq over the years. Um, yeah, but at the same time, its history is done. But problem is, you cannot redo things but the whole situation could have been avoided very easily because saddam hussein just needed money because his country just collapsed after the first like the iran iraq war 
because well, because you know, we laid waste everything. to their production. Yeah, yeah. So obviously yeah. he was worried about his own safety because yeah. people will go after him. Right. Did you see the Werner Herzog uh, documentary about Iraq after the first Gulf War? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you know how the whole myth was. Did you remember that? I think you could remember like when lots of things came out that Iraqi soldiers went to this hospital and throwing out the children's. Oh yeah, throwing out the babies things. from the incubators. That that's that line. And, yeah. and like yeah. and like Bruce <clears throat> Neer was telling this, and also like Dick Cheney during that time as well. You know, telling this story again and again. And that's a twenty-four hour CNN. There was also the story about the soldier that had been the female soldier that had been taken hostage by the Iraqis and these brave people went and rescued her, which was the opposite way. And so the Iraqis said, we've got this soldier. We don't want to keep her as a POW. Would you like her? <laughs> the Americans turned the story around. <laughs> so they tried to rescue who is already rescued. That's right. It made it into a, a, daring, <laughs> a daring rescue story. Uh, we're helping a damsel in distress, and the Iraqis are going. We don't want to keep female POWs. Take, take, take her back, you know. I'm aware of time, Julian. So I'm thinking of like doing like a couple of sessions because I really want to cover. We covered like Carter, Reagan, and mm -hmm. then we moved to like you know Bush Senior, and then <laughs> so that will be interesting. Like you know, you leave memories from from there. And your yeah. understanding about those like regimes, empires, yeah. you know, the CEOs and how they behaved and, you know, um, what does it mean to the general public? So obviously the Biden is doing exactly the same thing, isn't it? If you see the history of America. Biden, Biden is a representative of Wall Street. Mm. Every piece of legislation he did, except for the Anita Hill hearings, was basically in order to enrich Wall Street. The, the general idea is if you can please Wall Street, the chances are you will get another term. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and as I'm sure Boris Johnson could explain that to you if you didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Julian, I mean, thank you so much for your time today. So I kind of stopped my recording here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.